So oh, awesome. Thank you, whoever did that. This will also be the first thing I've done besides eating, sleeping, and hanging out with family since the new year. So <laughs> it'll be fun to discuss. Get back into it. Yesterday was technically a, a work day. And, um, but our kids are off from school and we have family in town and sort of we're planning to take the week off. But just the, the barrage of emails all of a sudden was yeah. very, Oof. very unwelcome. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm not ready for this yet. A reminder but, reality had kicked back yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. But I'm ready for this. This is gonna be really fun. <laughs> so whenever you're ready, Nafri. Okay, perfect. So I'll bring out the first eloquence. So today we have a 69-year-old female who presents with a chief complaint of bilateral lower extremity swelling and pain. I'll stop here for the first. Sounds great. Thank you, Nafri. All right, so I can um, take this first aliquot and Nafri, thank you again for presenting on your birthday. That's so special um, for all of us. So we have a 69 year old female with bilateral lower extremity swelling and pain. So at this juncture, you know, really the problem I'm trying to solve is bilateral lower extremity edema. And before we tackle the fact that it's bilateral, I think any time we have edema, the first key question is to ask whether it's unilateral edema or bilateral edema, because that can really influence the differential that we're building. Um, the main way is that if it's unilateral swelling or edema, <clears throat> my mind is more likely, or I'm going to start thinking about local causes, whether that's cellular whether that's local cellulitis or a baker's cyst that has ruptured, for example. So I'm going to start at a more local process versus if it's bilateral, I'm going to start at a more systemic process. And that's what we have here. So I think what I am first am thinking of are, is this volume overload from a heart issue, a liver issue, a kidney issue, and um, also in addition to kind of those three organ systems, are there any medications on board that could be causing this edema? So just to summarize, the fact that it's bilateral, I'm more likely thinking of a systemic process rather than a local process. And I would be looking on um, looking for other signs on physical exam that may help us make progress on those three organ systems. And then also briefly checking the med list to see if there's amlodipine on there, for example. Um, and also I'd be interested in the time course to see how long this has been going on. Steph Zavin, what else, um, what are your thoughts at this juncture? Beautiful, Maddie. Um, you know, the, the other medication that I recently heard that I still haven't like, I guess, internalized enough to pay attention and diagnose this in anybody, but uh, gabapentin. Um, has anybody actually seen a case of like, edema from gabapentin, stopped the medication, it resolved, just curious in the chat. And then if anyone can look up that, what, what's the actual rate of that happening? Because mm. so many of our patients are on gabapentin and so many of those patients are on gabapentin because they have advanced diabetes and they also have a touch of heptad for this or that. So I think it's such a hard judgment to, to blame the gabapentin, but I, but knowing the actual base rate of it mm. would be really helpful. Right. Um, I, uh, I have nothing to add to the uh, to the differential for the edema, Maddie. That was like beautiful, beautiful and comprehensive. Like I'll layer on kind of how I would think about the pain, which you may have glossed over very appropriately, because um, in uh, causes of leg swelling that are a little bit more acute, oftentimes the tissue edema stretch is sort of there's not enough time to, I guess, compensate. And uh, there's quite a bit of injury that could happen with acute um, edema, even from originally non-inflammatory causes like cirrhosis or heart failure. But then once you damage those tissues, um, sterile inflammation can happen and uh, you can get pain. And some some people uh, are exquisitely tender in their, in their um, over their edema to the point where I've actually developed the habit that when I palpate and test for edema, um, honestly, where I palpate anything at this point, I, I apply the lesson that most of us learned in medical school with abdominal examination of uh, whenever you're palpating someone's belly to look at their 
space to see when it's tender, if it's tender, and thus to not push any harder than you have to, or to essentially know that it is tender because some people won't speak up, right? And I've seen plenty of, you know, people sort of mashing on people's bellies and they're going like this and the examiner is completely oblivious to the fact that there's tenderness because they're not. So having almost been like kicked in the face um, by uh, by a patient's, re you know, reflexive um, reaction to pain, I think it's a good um, good habit I'd recommend. Um, the, the, the one kind of caveat to, to kind of what I said is, you know, um, um, Maddie mentioned that uh, for unilateral uh, edema, she would be more likely to consider local causes, right? And local causes include not only venous obstruction, which is a common cause of unilateral, right, um, edema, but also inflammatory causes. You mentioned cellulitis as one, but there can be other, you know, uh, mimickers of, of, of cellulitis um, and that uh, when they're actually mimickers, are more likely to happen bilaterally than you unilaterally. Examples being venous stasis, examples being, I don't know, erythema nodosum or any number of um, kind of inflammatory systemic uh, diseases that manifest in the skin and the, in the subcutaneous tissues. Um, but, but of course, all of those are kind of afterthoughts compared to the, the, uh, the primary framework that, that Maddie de deployed for us. Great, we'll hear more, uh, Navpreet. Thank you for the amazing starting discussion, Mary and, and Shem. And uh, yeah, in this eloquence, I'll give uh, HPI and past medical history. Uh, so patient, a 69-year-old female, she presented to her primary care physician due to bilateral swelling and pain in her calf. Uh, the PCP ordered a leg ultrasound, and that was negative for DVT, and he prescribed her on Lasix. Uh, despite taking LASIK, there was no improvement in her symptom, and patient independently also increased her LASIK dose to alleviate her symptom, but uh, the swelling progressed to involve her both thighs and some part of lower abdomen. That was when the time patient rushed to the hospital to seek the treatment. Along with the leg swelling, patient complained of some right-hand numbness and swelling in the bilateral upper extremities. On review of symptoms, she denies any chest pain, no shortness of breath, no rash, no joint pains, no headache, fever, or chill. Uh, past medical history, she has a vitamin D deficiency. She has a history of hypothyroidism, GERD, and hyperlipidemia. On medication, she is taking vitamin D tablets, levothyroxine, pentaprazole, and simvastatin. No significant past surgical history, family history, no significant, and no history of any allergy. And I'll stop here. Great. Thanks, Napreet. Maybe we can uh, <clears throat> tackle this as follows. I'll just maybe talk a bit about the initial evaluation and response or lack thereof to the LASIX and share a couple of thoughts on the arm swelling. Maybe Zavin, if you want to give some thoughts on the right hand numbness, and then Maddie, maybe then add on any thoughts you have based on the meds and medical history with that. <clears throat> um. So I think the what this person's physician did really sort of mimics um, what we had in terms of our broad differential diagnosis for causes. I think it makes a lot of sense and it's extremely practical to consider first, right, what, uh, that this is from volume overload and sort of treat the likely etiology just empirically. I think um, a teaching point that's come up before on clinical problem solvers is when you see bilateral leg swelling and you are, you know, worried about um, some of the systemic causes that you mentioned, Maddie, bring your head up and have a look at the neck. And one thing that we don't know right now is, you know, to what extent was there signs of intravascular volume overload as well as the swelling in the legs? Because the interesting twist here um, is that the arms are swollen too. And I think right away that brings away some of the gravity dependent kind of physiology that happens with venous stasis edema. Um, and even in heart failure, even in cirrhosis, right, having profound arm swelling, I guess it can happen, but it would be a lot later stage and sort of brings up the question of, is this person actually developing anasarca, right? Is this diffuse swelling all over the place? So the fact that there's arm swelling here, I think really even more moves us into those systemic categories of what could be going on and makes me want to really kind of quickly look at um, the renal category, as well as, right, not completely writing off the hepatic or, or cardiac causes 
but the rapid, the onset of this arm swelling. And I'm sorry enough, Preet, if I missed it, but kind of what the time course of these symptoms would be. It seems like they've been at least subacute, um, but the quick involvement in the story of the syndrome of the arms just stands out to me as a unique feature that makes it maybe not run of the mill heart failure, run of the mill cirrhosis. Um, and then I'll just comment on like the Lasix as a test of treatment, so to speak. Again, I think very realistic to what would be done in real life. Why didn't it work? One is, is this for some reason not a problem with total body volume overload? Um, you know, I can't think of a way necessarily that um, outside of Anasarca that we can have the arms and legs swollen so quickly, but right, like multiple areas of venous obstruction, for example, right? You wouldn't expect that to get better with Lasix. Or is it an issue with dosing, right? Is whatever dose they were put on actually not an effective dose to help this person? I would say that's probably more often um, why um, oral diuretics don't work. It's either dosing or absorption or adherence problem. So I think it's um, the kind of course that we've had of this empiric treatment not working is very helpful. And it makes us think sort of beyond the most common etiologies and with that arm involvement also just really start thinking broadly about all of those systemic causes, but particularly ones that drive anosarca that Maddie mentioned. Um, but the arm tingling, what do you think? And it's just right arm tingling. Huh? Yeah, I'll be quick on arm tingling and just say that whenever you do have um, extremity edema, um, I, I've, I've seen patients kind of experience a lot of uh, a spectrum of symptoms with that and kind of a feeling of numbness or tingling is 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 within that range. So so not wanting to make the mistake of solving the wrong problem, um, I would first my next step would just be to be a to, to do a sensory neurologic exam and see if there's actual objective kind of sensory loss. Um, and, and just to tease out kind of how how persistent or severe um, that tingling is before before starting to think that there's both and anasarca syndrome and a potential, you know, neuropathy syndrome for which there's overlap, right? Um, we can think of a couple of diagnoses that could unite those already, but but before going there, I would kind of want to um, conf confirm that on exam and not not start going off in the wrong direction. And then I just second Steph's emphasis of the importance of assessment of venous pressures because that's really an important branch point b between, um, you know, some of the things we've already mentioned and sort of a, an entirely different problem of capillary leak, for example, that um, that we haven't gone into appropriately because it would be a, a less common. And, and um, again, we need to identify that that uh, signature of that syndrome on exam with decreased venous pressures before going in that direction. Maddie, I forgot what Steph well, asked you to just tackle. Curious if the past medical and meds kind of prioritize any particular diagnoses or directions to go in. Yeah, I, I'm right there with both of you. And I think, um, Steph, similar to what you mentioned, when we heard about the, um, but oh, it's the bilateral upper extremity. I kind of thought it was just one. But when we heard of the upper extremity swelling, my mind really changed from, you know, cons perhaps this is not just a gravity dependent process. And perhaps we need to be thinking about anasarca, exactly as you said. And, you know, still with anasarca, considering is this still an atypical presentation of those three organ systems, the heart, liver, the kidney, but also looking at the past medical history, this patient has a history of hypothyroidism, which can lead to um, anasarca, to my understanding. And um, so I think that really stood out to me as, you know, that past medical history could, you know, potentially cause um, this degree of swelling, perhaps. So I would want to understand how the patient is taking the medications and then also wanting to um, get thyroid hormones, a TSH to check for that. Um, and then also to the anasarca, if we're, I'm thinking, you know, trying to figure out, are we solving the problem of anasarca or are we still solving the problem of bilateral lower extremity edema? But if we're at least considering anasarca, um, as you mentioned, really to given that the, there wasn't a clear response to Lasix, really wanting to consider renal issues, um, concerned about nephrotic syndrome. So wanting to get a UA, for example, um, so that's that's where my mind is at. Just I really um, the hypothyroidism stood stood out to me as a potential explanation for the swelling, and then given the more diffuse swelling that's not just in gravity dependent areas, wanting to get a, a UA to look for nephrotic syndrome too. Love it. Yeah, I think the hypothyroidism to me sort of stood out because it it can make limbs swell for the mechanism you mentioned. Right, you can't actually get um, interstitial kind of edema and fluid, particularly with profound 
hypothy hypothyroidism, but um, you can get right deposition in those tissues too in severe um, thyroid disease, often on the other side of the spectrum um, with uh, hyperthyroid or thyrotoxic syndromes, but like thyroid dermopathy causes swelling, not always just of the pretibial area. It can be other areas like the arms and the parts of the torso too. But in that case, it's right. That's deposition of stuff, specifically glycosaminoglycan. So I think an exam, knowing if the swelling is pitting a knot is going to be an important branch point as, as in addition to kind of the neck exam, et cetera. All right. Now, Preet, what do you got for us? Thank you, guys. I love your discussion, how you consider each symptom and then give differential. I'm loving that discussion. So in this next eloquence, I'll give the vitals and physical examination. So patient is afebrile, pulse is 68 per minute, regular, blood pressure is 144 by 67 on admission, respiratory rate of 18, and patient is maintaining saturation of 97% on room air. A uh, patient is alert and oriented to time, place, person. Uh, H-E-E-N-T examination is no, normal, no lymphadenopathy. CVS examination is normal, S1, S2, heard, no murmur. On respiratory examination, patient have decreased bilateral breath sounds, and there are crackles that are heard on bilateral lower lung sites. Abdomen examination is soft, non-tender, there's no organomegaly. Neuroexamination is normal. And on extremities, patients have three plus pitting, pitting edema on bilateral lower extremities. Uh, edema is extending till mid of thigh. And patients also have bilateral upper extremities, which shows edema of three plus till mid humerus. And I'll stop here. Uh, Preet, um, were you able to estimate the uh, jugular venous pressure by chance? Uh, that was normal. Okay. And then no no objective kind of, I don't know if this was, again, um, salient enough to be confirmed with exam that the tingling, but any anything neurologic that? Yeah. Uh, no, over? that was normal as well. That was a kind of a non-specific finding for the patient at that time. Thank you. Um, so can I, uh, bef before um, uh, ask, asking Maddie to, um, to weigh in on anything on the exam, um, someone, I think Shreyas, I noticed, um, uh, shared a link to um, Kara Lau's uh, extremity or edema thought train. And if I, I just want to give everybody like a minute to click on that, because it is so good. Um, and just see, see if it helps us in this case. So um, yeah, somebody can like hum the Jeopardy music um, for final Jeopardy, or you can do it in your hands, but <laughs> in your brains, but take a look at that. Do, 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 Love it. Do, do. <laughs> It's really good because um, it both, you know, uses this framework of unilateral, bilateral, um, and a sarca, right? Sort of breaks down um, the causes of unilateral. But I, I love how the sort of base rate is also integrated uh, just with sort of the, um, what you do first and then second pass. Um, so if you haven't already, just uh, save that for, for a closer look later because I do think it's just an amazing kind of um, synthesis of multiple multiple schemas and approaches. Maddie, what do you think about this exam? Yeah, well, looking at Tara's amazing thought train, you know, so we're at we're in the bilateral category. So, and so she has on her schema, you know, considering more systemic causes over local, and then really another branch point branch point is the exam. And I, I would consider from this exam, this is um, exam positive. We're seeing really diffuse edema both in the uh, bilateral lower extremities and um, is it both upper extremities or just one? I'm sorry, I don't I just want to. Uh, it's about bilateral upper extremities. Okay, so really, this is um, diffuse edema, and really considering anasarca, given how diffuse it is. But then, importantly, in addition, is we're getting some signal from the pulmonary exam. We're hearing um, decreased bilateral breath sounds and crackles. And um, if you look at Kara's amazing thought train, you know. Um, if you have crackles and dyspnea, that may point to lung congestion, which would prompt you to consider um, congestive heart failure. I would expect an elevated um, jugular venous pressure. So that's something that um, 
Enough pre. I'm sorry. Did you say that you weren't able to assess it, or it was normal? It was normal. Cardiac examination was normal. Okay. So, I mean, that would give me a little bit of pause because if we are thinking about the heart and if heart congestive heart failure is causing this extensive lung congestion, I would expect there to be elevated jugular venous pressure. So that's that's a bit of a surprise for me and um, is causing me to, um, you know, I'm definitely considering heart being on the hook for this, but um, considering other organs given that I would really expect that, but I'm not really sure about the specificity of that exam. So I would, would want to learn about that. But um, I think going forward, I still want to you know, we're not seeing any signs of ascites which, um, or jaundice, um, which makes me less concerned for a liver issue here, if we're thinking of those three organ systems. Um, and I would still want to assess the kidney. So I'd want to get a UA and look to see if there's any protein in the urine, for example, to um, assess our nephrotic syndrome hypothesis. I'm curious, Steph Zavin, how, like, what progress we can make from this exam, you think? Um, yeah, I think I'm with you in that the, the not strikingly high, you know, up by the ear JV lowers the probability for cardiac a little bit, but with crackles, with effusions, I think very appropriate to kind of keep that on the table as we kind of otherwise look to the kidneys. I think the lack of like significant ascites is helpful to make lower the portal hypertensive etiologies on there. Um, but I think we're in those kind of general categories. Um, and, you know, I'll just say kind of other little things that stood out to me. She's, um, her heart rate is normal, right? Low normal, not profoundly tachycardic, which one, you know, certainly would expect in um, thyroid kind of excess or perhaps really decompensated heart failure. So I'm just noticing normal is normal and a, a couple quick thoughts on that. And then, um, not frankly hypertensive, right? But her systolic blood pressure is running high and we'll just kind of have to put a pin on that and see if it fits in with whatever kind of final syndrome we find out. Um, but I think otherwise we're kind of headed in the directions of sort of needing the diagnostics from the urine and then definitely probably some chest and heart imaging. Um, but it sounds like we'll start with the labs first, I'm Preet. Perfect, I'll, I'll start with the labs. So uh, I'll give the lab and some few of the imaging in this aliquot. So patient on admission, patient has a hemoglobin of 7.3. And during the hospital course, it dropped to 6.8. And patient got a transfusion. And after that, patient has been maintaining of hemoglobin of 7.5. Hematocrit is 24. And platelet count is of 632. WBC count is 15.7 with neutrophils of 79% and lymphocytes of 12%. Patient CRP is... 238, which is high, and ESR of 58. On CMP, all electrolytes are normal. Sodium is normal. Chloride is normal. Bicarb is normal. But patient has a potassium of 5.8. Patient have a BUN of 60 and creatinine of 3.0. Her baseline is 0 0.7. Patient has a GFR of 16. Uh, calcium is on the lower side. Uh, the total potassium is 5.5 and albumin of 1.5. Patient has a mild elevation of AST of 42, and rest of all our ALT bilirubins are normal. A patient's complement level are normal, and SPAP is normal. There is no monoclonal glomerulopathy. And we have some imaging done on this patient. Blood culture are negative, don't show any growth till today. Urine culture is negative for Legionella. Renal ultrasound is done. It doesn't show any hydronephrosis and there is no nephrolithiosis. And repeat ultrasound of legs is done and it has been negative for DVT. I'll stop here. What are you seeing, Maddie? Yeah, so just to call out some of the abnormalities. Um, so I'm seeing uh, an anemia here that has uh, temporarily worsened. And I believe I heard in a previous said that the patient got a transfusion, if that's correct. Yes. Um, importantly, the other, you know, I think when you see one bloodline down, you I really look at the others to see, uh, you know, are the other bloodlines down and what is the pattern there? And we're seeing um, a thrombocytosis um, and also an elevated white count that's neutrophil predominant. 
Uh, we're seeing elevated inflammatory markers with the CRP that's high. We're seeing um, hyperkalemia, I believe, a low albumin. And um, what I don't see the numbers here, but I believe a, an AKI that we're also seeing. Is that right? I didn't yeah, see the creatinine yeah, listed. And, yeah. So um, to me, you know, I we had talked about the the kidney being on the hook here. And we, especially with this presentation of edema, we were concerned about nephrotic syndrome, which is when you have damage to the glomerulus and you lose protein. Um, and I'm more concerned about that now with the kidney injury and with the low albumin. Um, you know, with the kidney injury, you think pre, intra, post, renal. Um, Nafpreet told us about the renal ultrasound that didn't show signs of hydrophrosis, no stones. So I'm narrowing in on the pre and then the intra. And then with this, um, the, with the significant AKI and with the low albumin, I'm most concerned for an intra renal process, specifically nephrotic syndrome. Um, so I want to get a UA for that and um, kind of like quantify the amount of protein that they're losing. Um, and if we kind of go down that hypothesis, I know that nephrotic syndrome it can be secondary to uh, causes, and I'm kind of forgetting that list, but I'd have to pull up my notes and kind of send tests for those other things that can cause secondary nephrotic syndrome. Um, I'm not, let's see, I'm not quite sure how to incorporate the anemia yet. Um, I'm, you know, I'm less concerned of like an underproduction issue because the other, like I'm not so concerned for a bone marrow issue. There's no obvious signs of blood loss. Is there peripheral destruction in some way? Do we need to send hemolysis labs? But the platelets are fine. So I'm not quite sure how to incorporate that yet, but I think my takeaway here is that um, nephrotic syndrome is something I want to assess for. Totally. I think that's yeah. um, that's kind of what, what things are looking like. Um, you know, nephrotic syndrome, uh, pre presumed, we need to confirm it, right? Like that urine protein creatinine ratio, uh, some lipids are, are really critical right now. Um, but assuming that's the case, that there's that as well as a systemic inflammatory signature. So the, you know, the anemia could be part CKD, but it could also be part inflammation, right? Um, uh, the platelets, I, I do think, are, you know, are, are a signal of, uh, of chronic inflammation in this case. Um, I'm really glad that, you know, Napri, you you mentioned sort of up front that the SPEP was, and free light chains, I believe you said, were negative, because that globulin gap is also a little borderline at four, the difference between the total protein and the albumin. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we need to confirm nephrosis and then do the secondary workup, which, you know, I, I one sort of um, element I, I want to mention to that is that there's the standard testing of secondary causes, um, um, things like, you, you know, HIV, hepatitis, serologies, RPR, um, and, but there's, uh, and, and then if there's a sort of a concern for an, an element of nef nephritis as well, obviously the list broadens to include um you know, um, uh, ANA and ANCAs and anti-GBM syndrome, et cetera. Um, but uh, so importantly, to the list of that, um, um, uh, we need to we need to be adding uh, new antibodies that have been dis discovered to 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 be causing uh, primary nephrotic syndrome. Uh, the uh, PLA two receptor antibody being the most um, famous. But uh, I think recently I I read that there was a second one that accounts for. Um, almost the rest of the proportion of cause of primary uh, membranous nephropathy. Um, if, if somebody, is that, Vijay, is that, yeah, that uh, sounds right. Is that, are you answering the, the that question I just raised, Vijay? Almost bond in 7A. Um, uh, anyway, so so I think a lot of times um, those, uh, we, can, we can now sort of have a more specific diagnosis just with serologic testing. Um, Anything else, Steph? Um, no, I think the one thing I'm tossing over my in my mind is like, are we going to have some nephritic overlap also? I'm bringing that up because again, back to she doesn't have overt hypertension, but you know her systolic blood pressure is a touch high. I'm struck by the degree of kidney injury she has, and we don't know how long this is going on. Maybe it's been a while, and that is an explanatory model for the anemia. If this is all kind of hypoproliferative from low EPO, um, 
but I'm, I'm sort of wondering if we're actually going to see fairly active sediment with a, a lot of reds in addition also. And, you know, there's a whole category of kind of nephritic, nephrotic overlap, but um, membrane proliferative glomerular nephritis and its causes would be the most <clears throat> pertinent category if we do see that in the, in the EUA. Actually, that's a good point. You're just, you're making me realize that most causes of nephrotic syndrome, um, I feel like shouldn't have such, such systemic inflammation. Right, if you think about FSGS, minimal change, right? Like, malignancy associated would be the- That's a good point, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it depends on what they're secondary to, but um, anyway, okay. Give us a little more nap break. Perfect, the chat is on fire and in this aliquot, I'll give the UA analysis result as well. So uh, when the patient was in the hospital, she developed some mild shortness of breath. And uh, for that, they did a CT chest. CT chest shows normal, there was no pulmonary embolism. It showed multifocal nodules and consolidated opacity in bilateral lung, suspected of some multifocal pneumonia. Along with that, patient have right and left fifth rib saclerotic sacro lesions. Uh, we did a UA on the patient. It, it has been positive for large amount of blood and positive for leukocyte aspirase. Urine analysis show 40 plus RBCs. 21 plus WBC, some WBC cast and granular cast, and some trace amount of protein. Patient membranous glomerulopathy is negative, anti GBM is normal. And I'll stop here. And next is my final adequate. Wow. <laughs> you want to jump is... in first, Maddie? I'm, I'm turning things sure. over my mind still of sort of where we are. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> this is such an interesting case and I'm, um, uh, uh, yeah, so let's try to kind of sift through this new information we got here. So we got this CT chest that showed multifocal nodules, multifocal nodules concerning for multifocal pneumonia, these interesting le sclerotic lesions on the ribs. And then, you know, when we got the UA, I was really keeping an eye out for is, are we going to see protein and is this going to be more of a nephrotic or more of a nephritic picture here? And um, I, I, maybe I was a little bit surprised that there's quite a lot of blood here. So I'm there's kind of an inflammatory signature to this UA. And um, I believe I heard Nafpreet say a minimal amount of proteins. Um, and so it seems like predominantly blood here. Um, so I think what I'm trying to figure out is what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Does this constitute nephritic syndrome? And that's the... Um, pathway we should be going down. Um, but I guess just to take a step back, because I, I think I'm not quite sure what problem we should be solving here. Um, so maybe just to summarize everything. So that's a 69 year old female who has this, seems like subacute history of swelling in all four limbs, who is now found to have um, you know, a, an inflammatory syndrome that involves both the lungs and the kidney. Um, and I guess I would, I, would, I would leave it at that. But uh, I guess if we were to solve nephritic syndrome, you would expect there to be red blood cell cast, but I don't think we're seeing that. Um, so I guess before we're trying to solve like the problem here, I'm curious, um, Zavin and Steph, like what what do you think is the dominant problem we should be solving here? How are you putting it together or what's standing out to you? I think that I think that's a that's the key question, right? And um I think what what threw all of us a little bit was that we got not one pivot point, but two pivot points. <laughs> or, or multiple pivot, what would have been pivot points if they were in isolation, right? So if you see a bunch of pulmonary nodules and opacities and ground glass, suddenly pulmonary renal syndromes rise up, right? Now you're you're um, thinking more about, you know, ANCAs and um, uh, uh, whereas if you take bone bone lesions, right, and, and nephritic syndrome, then uh, then you might be thinking about sort of um, causes of nephritis that are either driven by malignancy or monoclonal gammopathies, et cetera, right? So um, the thing is that, that it's kind of both. And when it's both, suddenly I don't necessarily have as solid of a unifying diagnosis for everything. And I think in those cases, it's helpful to consider 
to sort of like subtract one at a time and see how the frame looks. And with with the justification of of subtracting being, what if one of those things is either incidental or like a secondary complication, right? So for example, pneumonia is very common in in patients with nephrotic syndrome and patients with, you know, a lot of reasons why this this patient could could have an abnormal immune system, right? Or neurologic function, et cetera. So what if the lung stuff is just not related to the primary syndrome, but a complication? So um, so that helps you kind of um have a more thorough differential diagnosis potentially and not miss anything because you're trying to like think of only things that could, um, uh, or if you, so, uh, so, or if you ignore the sclerotic, sclerotic, sclerotic bone lesions and consider that maybe there's, um, um, you know, I don't, Pat Paget's disease, I don't know how multifocal this, this is and how typical in appearance, but, um, you know, you could consider that the, there's uh, a benign unrelated cause of that. Um, like I already mentioned. So, so I, I, or another approach is just to be like, okay, forget, forget trying to come up with a perfect problem representation, right? Where we try to prioritize a syndrome that connects everything. What if we just realize that we have a problem list? We have what looks like nephritis and we need to evaluate nephritis to its fullest, serologically and quite frankly, with a biopsy in this case. We have... Um, you know, pulmonary lesions, and we need to consider the full spectrum of what they could be. We have, um, you know, bone lesions, and we need to construct the differential diagnosis for those and sort of do a deep dive, um, uh, including with sort of the importance of, of kind of reviewing with radiology exactly the appearance and the radiographic differential, which is extremely helpful when you're dealing with bone lesions. Um, and then see where the triangulation happens, where the overlap of, of those differentials is. Um, that being said, Austin is saying, 69-year-old woman with hypothyroidism, presenting with a question mark, so acute <laughs> anasarca. That's being inflamed with likely new renal injury and active urinary sediment, multifocal pulmonary nodules, um, excluding the, the bone lesions. Anyway, any thoughts on that? Um... Yeah, I guess the the what do the some of these normal labs mean? Because we actually started getting kind of some workup for glomerular nephritis or glomerular conditions right before we had the UA. And just a quick comment on the normal serum protein electrophoresis <clears throat> means there's no kind of monoclonal light chain plus heavy chain protein there. But I think I saw in the chat, and I completely agree the thought of. Um, myeloma potentially still being on there in its light chain only form. And so kind of completing the workup for that um, uh, plasma cell dyscrasia with serum-free light chains, et cetera. I think also the, the minimal protein on the UA with her degree of anasarca is just standing out to me as, as unusual. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the protein in the UA is all albumin measured. So I still think we need a urine protein to creatinine ratio because we're getting at SPEP is normal, but it doesn't cover light chains, right? UA protein is normal, but doesn't cover non-albumin um, factors. So I think just as we're working through our differential diagnosis, making sure, oh, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of forget that there's some final test to get to assess whether there is a plasma cell dyscrasia to assess whether there actually is protein in the urine or not. Um, and then um, I do think what'll help us is having the normal complements, right? Whatever this is, we know it's not one that lowers complements, which kind of helps us start narrowing down in the nephritis category pretty readily, right? Into I know ankyovasculitis was mentioned. I don't think IgA nephropathy fits as well here, but IgA kind of related vasculitis would have normal complement. So I think in my problem representation, you know putting in normal complement levels, I think is very helpful as we sort of narrow in on the final diagnosis. Because I think light chain myeloma, definitely possible. Ankyovasculitis, definitely possible as well. Both of those could explain both the, the renal issue as well as the pulmonary pathology, whether infectious inflammation or not. Um, I think on my wish list would be completing the plasma cell and protein assessment tests. Um, and then, yeah, if we don't kind of have a great explanation otherwise, um, uh, getting a kidney biopsy from there.
So what do we want to do? Do we, we haven't put our money down on anything. We just have a wish list of more things we want. Any, because I think that pre, right. You're going to kind of help us um, wrap up the case after this. Is that right? Yeah. So are we ready for the final early quiz or no? That's what I'm asking my no, teammates let's, here. Let's, let's pause a second. <laughs> um, I think, I think the, you know, some of the, some of the, we we know part of what's missing, right? And and can can we just clarify, enough, uh, Preet? Like it's true that there was an S pep, but not free light chains or urine. The uh, the free chains were normal. There was no monoclonal glomerulopathy. And uh, if I give you some uh, viral markers, HIV, Hep C, and all, they were all normal. Great. Okay, thank you. So I think um I think the monoclonal monoclonal mm -hmm. gammopathy isn't quite. Then we can put that you know, to the side. Like panning out. I think poems is indeed a, you know, a diagnosis that is easy to to be enamored with. But, but if the M is missing and, you know, um, and and I'm not sure really there was ever a P. Uh, you know, or wait, the P is polyendocrinopathy, organomegaly. Wait, no, endocrinopathy, polyneuropathy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure there was ever a P. Yeah. No O, and then there's no S. Right. We could do some iterative, um, a second look at some of the skin findings, like you know, abnormal sort of hairy patches or other lesions that um, can be characteristic. But um, I think it's important to um, to not not sort of, um, uh, anyway, anchor too much on, on that great idea, but it's, it's not quite painting out. So so I think, um, and then the bone just bone lesions, can I just clarify too, Navpreet, like, again, exactly how many were there and how what were they described on radiology? Uh, I don't have the number, but they were bilaterally present. And uh, the radiologically consider them as a benign lesion. Okay. okay. They thought they were benign. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think, uh, and again, like th th these these details really matter, right? And and they matter because they make you include something in your problem representation or 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 not. Um, as well as the details of what exact information do we have or not have, and what's you know what's what's pending. So I do think the the sense I'm getting is that this is um, nephritic syndrome. And then, uh, and then pneumonitis, you know, to, to, to use a very vague term, uh, but not necessarily in a pattern of, of, of typical bacterial pneumonia. Um, so it does seem like there's uh, a pulmonary renal syndrome, again, the most, the most common uh, of which in this context is ANCA associated vasculitis. So that's, that's sort of the, where I would, if I were a betting man, which I am, <laughs> probably what I'd guess. Any final thoughts, Maddie? No, I I really love the teaching from both of you, and I I'm right there with you that I think an an Inca associated vasculitis is something I'm most concerned about. So I would um probably want both the Inca serologies, but um also a renal biopsy. Hey, sorry, can I just make one more point to the to to the idea of like you want to question how complete your information is, is just how important it is to like do iterative, you know, information gathering, right? So anchors don't take a while to come back, you know, kidney biopsies take a while to do and come back. Um, but like, have we looked closely enough, both on history and exam, um, to this patient's sinuses and ears and eyes and skin, right? Sort of a signature of a small vessel vasculitis in the form of a, uh, you know, a typical, um, uh, uh, petechial rash or whatever. So I think there's we could we could further refine our pretest probability with cheap, easy, immediately available tests, um, especially on the positive side if we find additional supporting findings. Hmm. I love the discussion. And should I continue? Please, excited. I, I I wish that you could have bet on something else today. You could have won a lot of money. <laughs> And uh, yeah, there was this really good uh, teaching point as Deva was telling us um, that even on UA, if there's trace protein and you have a high suspicion of urine analysis, you go for a urine grad ratio and, and uh, to further to see if it's a true protein urea or not. So we did a use spot on this test on this subject patient, and it shows a value of 1094.5. Normal high end is like 100 microgram, it's pretty high. Uh, when we order GBM and all, we also order ANCA. Uh, so the ANCA result was pending at that time. So the moment when we order a kidney biopsy, we also got the results of ANCA. And C ANCA came out to be 1,320. And the kidney biopsy is done on the subject. And it shows active posse immune 
focal precentric necrotizing glomerulonephritis due to CNK and acute tubular necrosis with scattered tubular red blood cell cast. And that was our final diagnosis. And patient was started on rituximab and corticosteroid. And after that, patient has been doing well. Uh, six week follow up patient anemia is improving. His uh, creatinine has been dropped down to 2.1. And the cyclotic region are still under workup. They are uh, by radiologists, they said that they have benign lesions, but uh, they need additional workup on that. And uh, pulmonology, they are not concerned about the CT findings because according to them, the they're in CN curves, we can have nodular opacities. And that was it. And that's a really interesting case that we had there today. And shout, and I just want to give a shout out to attending Jazz. He helped me prepare this case, and that's all. Fantastic case, Namprit. I love the the way you broke it down. And I'll just open a group. I think this ended up in a very different place than I thought, starting with leg swelling and then progressing to anasarca, right? And just sort of a reminder of quite a bit of overlap between the sort of nephritic nephrotic spectrum and, um, you know, the, the UA being so helpful, all the urine studies, the UA as well as the urine protein being incredibly helpful to sort of tease out where that was. Um, because ending up with vasculitis with the initial presentation is is not what I've expected at all. So thanks for thanks for taking us there, Naz. Other reflections from you guys? Yeah, Navpri, this was a truly phenomenal case presentation, and thank you so much for preparing it and um, on your birthday. <laughs> and yeah, I have a lot to reflect on with this case and just kind of the the journey and of the nephrotic nephritic spectrum and kind of how to work that up. And um, this was a phenomenal case, but a lot to reflect on for this. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Nafri. Um, I, I I do wonder whether some of the edema was multifactorial, just a combination of both, you know, um, a very low albumin, obviously, um, and and inflammation, capillary leak. So not only not only is there less oncotic pressure to keep things in, but the vascular permeability, right? In that Starling's equation, we forget that key key factor. And this patient's clearly so inflamed, and um, uh, I, I would guess it was sort of a combination of those things. Um, Mariana, before you you read out the teaching points, I wrote this in a chat, but that comment I made about the cause of nephrotic syndrome having being less likely to have systemic inflammation, it was very quickly debunked. I, or it was, it was an idea that I just sort of intellectually streaked and um and it was not correct. So uh yeah. Take us home, Mariana. Okay. I'm I'm gonna take this one out. But yeah, but it happens all the time. Sometimes we uh, we think about something and then we come up with other uh, um, causes for the this, this same thing. So let's go ahead with the teaching points. Uh, thank you so much, Never Paid for this amazing case and uh, uh, happy birthday. And thank you, Maddie and Steph and Zaven for uh, this amazing discussion. Uh, I learned so much with you guys today. So we started discussing unilateral and bilateral causes of uh, uh, lower edema. And we uh, you have to keep in mind that local causes can be inflammatory, such as cellulitis and venous obstruction. But we also can have inflammatory uh, causes manifesting bilaterally, such as venous stasis and erythema nodosum. Um, for the bilateral cause, we uh, in the majority of times, you're going to have systemic process such as heart, liver, and kidney, kidney injuries. And we also can have medications causing uh, uh, bilateral lower edema, such as gabapentin. And it's also important to check other signs and the physical exam to have a clue where the problem is. And the patient also had other symptoms, associated symptoms, uh, such as pain. Uh, if, and if it's acute, it could be due to stretch of tissues. And uh, it's also important to... Uh, uh, to assess the patient reaction to physical exam when you're, you're assessing the pain, because sometimes uh, 
you you don't ask the patient if it's 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 hurting or not or not you're just like uh doing the physical exam and paying attention to to the patient's reaction uh and the patient also had uh arm and swelling and then we started to think about anasarca but the the lasix didn't work so we had to think is it a dose issue or isn't the volume excess the the problem of this patient and the patient also had arm tingling but in a context of uh, of um, edema, it's expected. So it's important to do an, uh, a, a whole neurological exam to check if there is really a neuro impairment. Otherwise, we are going to go in the wrong direction. Um, and about NSRK, you have to think about medication compliance and or excess use. This patient had a history of thyroid disturbance. Uh, so uh, the edema uh, it could be the thyroid disturption could be caused interstitial edema and deposition of glycosaminoglucans, uh, but it it could also be uh, a sign of nephrotic syndrome. And then at this point, we have uh, things that helped us in our uh, differentials because we had crackles. So we started to think about lung congestions or uh, maybe congestion heart, heart failure, but the patient had no DVD, so we had less concern for heart failure. At the same time, the patient had no ascites or jaundice, so we, we didn't uh, have so much concern for liver causes and no tachycardia, so less concern of thyroid disturbance. So before the labs, we were like, Okay, what what can this patient have? Because it, there's no there isn't much signs in the, the the physical exam, but then with the labs, the patient had thrombocytosis, anemia, leukocytosis, hyperkalemia, and low albumin. And then we started to think uh, in the kidneys as the main culprit. Um, the patient could have a nephrotic syndrome, maybe secondary to something else, or, or the patient could have a nephritic overlap because of the touch high uh, blood pressure and because of the anemia. It could be a membranous proliferative glomerulonephritis, for example. And uh, the patient also had bone lesions and then we started to think about kidney issues associated with pneumonia and bone lesions. And at this point, it's important to uh, to uh, to assess if if it, it's all related to one condition or a uh, one condition could be causing uh, like pneumonia or bone lesions as complications. And at this point, it's, it's also important to do a problem list. So we had nephritis, uh, uh, pulmonary lesions, bone lesions, and it could be uh, multiple myeloma, plasma cell dyscrasias, monoclonal, monoclonal gramopathy, and cavasculitis. And also, uh, an important teaching period here is that the patient had minimal amount of proteins on UA, but the patient also had hypoalbuminemia. So uh, it, this highlights the importance of the urine albumin to creatinine ratio to uh, to assess if the patient really is not losing protein in the urine. So it's important to be aware of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana. That was awesome. And Ashutosh, thanks for subscribing. Um, happy New Year again, everybody. Have a great, great day. Happy birthday again, Napreet. Thanks for presenting. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Maddie. Great to see you as always. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.